Recently, I put out a video about the new D&D educator resources that have been released to sort of bring people into D&D from a school level or even an after school level. But I want to dive in a little bit deeper into the actual curricula used in the classroom. So stick with me. Welcome to Geek Philosophy, where we love geeky wisdom. If you're new to the channel, my name is Brian, and we release new videos weekly, so please consider subscribing and liking and turning on notifications and all of those things. All right, so on the Wizards of the Coast site, on the D&D section, that is, you'll notice that under gameplay up here, you'll see this four educators link and that's where I am now. And so this is where you get all of the resources around what is D&D, how to play, how to DM, all those things. I'm sticking with the educator section right now because that's what I wanna to go to. It's this link here, the D&D classroom that I'm gonna be diving in today. And that brings us over to this Young Minds Inspired site. This is where the lesson plans are housed and they're organized by grade level. And they also give some information on the basics of D&D and how to play. But I wanna specifically get into a few of the categories here that are available. So let me highlight one of the big things that I think is important if you're gonna be either trying to lead a D&D game or introducing it to your students, and that is just an overview of the game. So they do a great job of uh, putting together a handbook that explains what is Dungeons and Dragons, what do you need to play, how to get started, and then a link to learn more about D&D. So it's a very basic handout that is reproducible, so that means that you can copy and put it out for kids and parents so that they can see what D&D is all about and why you may be moving into that in your curricula. They also have a character overview handout, again, reproducible. There's a definition of cleric, fighter, paladin, rogue, and wizard, and it kind of gives you an idea of what that class is all about so that when the characters are in the game, these are the things they will be good at or that they will like to do. And when the players create those characters, um, they'll have a feel for what type of person they want to be in the game world. So a good example, I'll just start with the classic example of fighter. Players eager for action may feel themselves destined to become fighters. Masters of a wide range of weapons and combat styles, fighters are prepared for any situation, whether on the battlefield or in a monster's lair. With the strength to wield the mightiest sword and the speed to dodge the quickest blows, fighters play an essential part in every adventure. Then, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got wizards. Drawing their power from a deep study in the magical arts, wizards command spells for every occasion. They can devastate an opponent with a wave of thunder, disappear in a cloud of vanishing dust, or transport themselves into, or out of, a desperate situation in the nick of time. Though usually unskilled in the use of mundane weapons and armor, when defended properly, a wizard can be the deciding member of any adventure team. So the rest of those descriptions are there too. I just wanted to highlight a couple and you get the idea. There's also some really good artwork on the on the bottom of this sheet. I would say very kid friendly artwork. I love the Displacer Beast kitty cat that's there. It's really kind of interesting. So good stuff. Okay, for my educators out there, we have the Common Core English, Language Arts and Math standards for grades four through eight. Now, you may be in a state that doesn't use Common Core. You may be in a country that doesn't use our Common Core. But the point here is that they are tying it to real educational standards. And this correlation will help because as you read through, you'll likely be able to interpret this for the standards in your state or in your country for that matter. So I would highly suggest reading through this because at the very least, even if you're not worried about that, maybe you're just running the game for fun after school for kids and you're using the classroom curricula for that, I think it helps to really hone in on what the benefits are when you can look at some of these standards that could be addressed by playing D&D. I'll give you an example, so a writing standard here. Write informative, explanatory text to examine a topic and convey ideas and information clearly. That is done in D&D all the time. Let's go to reading. Uh, oh, here, reading informational text. Anytime they're consulting the rule books for anything, they're reading informational text, not just fantasy literature. They have to understand 
what the rules are, the game mechanics, the intents of a spell, which sounds like, oh, that's fantastical. No, this is real game mechanics baked in. Being able to read and interpret some of these descriptions and things is very high level reasoning in a lot of circumstances. So think about this as you're going through and reading some of these descriptions. For example, explain how an author uses reasons and evidence to support particular points in a text. Let's go down and let's look at something in the higher range of the grades here. So grade eight, vocabulary acquisition and use. Determine or clarify the meaning of unknown and multiple meaning words or phrases based on grade eight reading and content choosing flexibility from a range of strategies, or demonstrate understanding of figurative language, word relationships, and nuance in word meanings. I will say I've had plenty of conversation around a table about the meaning, about very specific words in some of the rules in Dungeons and Dragons. So much people get really passionate about their D&D and how to interpret the rules as written versus rules as implied. And those of you that are gamers know exactly what I mean. And those of you who are not, think about what that means. Rules as written versus rules as implied. This is important for a student to pick up the intent behind something and not just the strict word for word meaning of something. I, I see future lawyers coming out of D&D. Anyway, Let's move on, shall we? Now that we're in the actual build an adventure kit for the educator, it gives an overview about what you're doing as someone that's leading this whole initiative here. And the explanation of this whole D&D &D build an adventure program is very well laid out. It tells you what it includes, the teacher's guide, the reproducible activity sheets, the game character overview, which we just saw, handouts, and a digital magazine, which is also available. You can go in there and, and view the magazine, the standards we just looked at, and then a version of the program for both grades four through six and six through eight. So it gives you an overview of how to use the program, how it works in the classroom, and then you get into all the activities. I went on into an overview of these activities in the first video that I did, but I'm actually going to show those in a little bit more detail. So let me go down to activity one and we're going to kind of scroll through this. Characters create stories is the first activity and stories are all about the characters. Characters in a story are usually people, but they can be animals or even made up creatures. Sometimes they have special traits or magical powers that help them solve problems. When you write a story, you usually start by thinking about your character's traits. Will your character be brave or smart? Will they have fighting skills or magical powers? What will they look like? The same is true in the world of Dungeons and Dragons, D&D for short. In the game, you get to choose your own character. Your character must work with other characters to perform tasks and solve problems. How you and the others do that will affect what happens in the story. So. Again, this is focusing on character creation and how that will build the story and of the game that the players are gonna be taking part in, which is great. So ready to start your own D&D inspired adventure? Part one, who will your character be? Now, you've got the character overview handout that we just talked about, and then they get a chance to circle which one they wanna play. You've gone over the descriptions, they've read them, talked about it, make it a collaborative experience. This is often something that happens all the time in D&D where you want to make sure you have a balanced party of adventurers. So that's something that you can discuss here. And it also lets them think through the pros and cons, advantages, disadvantages. It highlights the fact that everybody has their own strengths and weaknesses. And I think it's a good thing that you can socialize amongst the people that are playing the game. Then what does your character look like? Describing their clothing, eyes, hair, height, etc. And then you can even have a little art activity and have them draw their character on the back of the sheet. Great stuff. In D&D, this is the third section in part one, the characters use skills that fall into these categories. And these are the main attributes of any character. This is built into the game since the very early days. They are strength, constitution, wisdom, dexterity, intelligence, and charisma. A little bit of vocabulary building for everyone and something that they will 
remember for everybody. So it's good stuff. Strength measures physical power. Constitution, in this case, measures endurance. And wisdom is all about measuring perception and insight. Not necessarily all about it, but these are two skills that fall under the wisdom category. But being wise is its own, you know, reward. So then we have dexterity, which measures your ability to move quietly and skillfully. Intelligence, measuring your reasoning and memory. And charisma, personality. You choose one of the skills above and write about how your character would use it to their advantage. This is interesting, right? Because they're building a character. They're thinking about how one of the skills or the attributes that we've listed here, strength, dex, con, all those things, how their character wants to use that for the advantage of themselves and the group and the story. There's a spot to write it down. So they're thinking about it and then writing and articulating why they would pick what they're picking in a very clear, concise way. This is a critical thinking and writing activity here. Great stuff. Part two. Now you're ready to create a character profile. This is something, by the way, that I know authors do all the time. They sometimes have notes so that they can keep their characters straight, so they can make sure that they're building characters for a story. And this has happened for centuries. People have done this. They've had notes on their characters as they're performing their writing process. So this is a skill that can translate into creative writing very easily. So let's look a little bit deeper into this. So now you're ready to create a character profile. Complete the chart below to bring your character to life. Okay. What's their epic name? Names are important. A distinguishing feature. Again, you as a teacher taking them through this can have some conversation about what does that mean? What is a distinguishing feature to them? Maybe it's a physical appearance. Maybe it's something that they have a habit of doing. A positive trait, something that they feel is very positive about their character. What are some skills that they have? Their greatest strength, but their main weakness as well, because you want to reinforce that everyone has them, right? A personal ideal and goal is also really important. If you have a character, and in, this is something very unique to role-playing games in general, but, you know, D&D was one of the originators of this early on, and then other tabletop role-playing games obviously do this as well, but being able to say, this is my character's goal, this is what I strive for, that helps you, if you're role-playing, to make decisions in the game as it progresses. And that's one of the things that we want to reinforce with the learners, that they are actually able to carry this forward in thinking about what their character will do in certain situations based on their ideals. And they're really interesting. The character's ideals and goals, by the way, not necessarily the player's ideals and goals. That's a different thing. On a separate sheet of paper, they write a backstory. So for example, how old is your character? They don't have to play someone their age. They could play someone far older, far younger. It doesn't matter. Do they come from a big city or a farm or wherever? Maybe they grew up in a treehouse. Do they have brothers, sisters, or pets? Have they been on any adventures before? Maybe they're brand new at this, or maybe they've been doing this for a little while. Maybe their older brother took them on adventures or their older sister trained them in how to use that sword. Has something sad or exciting happened in their life before? And then once you're done with all that stuff, you're kind of ready for action. The next activity, Imagine Your Own World, has a few different things. So this is where in part one, your character needs a place to live and have adventures. And in stories, the setting can be everything from a rabbit burrow to a large country in D&D. The storytelling takes place in a fantasy world filled with mystical locations and creature. Now, this is where the box set, the starter set comes in. For example, there's Stormwreck Isle, a small island occupied by two families of dragons who have been fighting each other for centuries. Read the backstory and description of Stormwreck Isle opposite. So you've got this about Stormwreck Isle section, gives the whole history there. Some great artwork, kid friendly. I really like it. Now... Uh, create an island next to Stormwreck Isle. I love this because it's not just saying, hey, you're going to have an adventure here. It's saying, okay, we've told you about this isle. Now create your own island and let's write it and tell about how there's a small population and this is where you're going to have your story. 
So on the back of the activity sheet, you sketch out an island and include the following things. You need the name for the island. You need, is it a cove, a lake? Oh, you actually have to have a cove, a lake, or another body of water. Besides the fact that it's surrounded by water, a tall geographical feature, a monster's lair, whatever they decide to put, and a place of safety. Maybe it is a base of operations for them. In part two, divide the island features you've mapped out among the players of your team and create a backstory for each one, explaining its significance on the island. So all these things that they just came up with, why are they there? What's the significance? How did the item form? Is it natural? Did someone build it? How big or deep is it? What does it look like? Write your backstories on separate paper. So now they're not just thinking about their character, but they're creating the setting. This happens in D&D all the time. Dungeon Masters usually are the ones that are putting all this stuff together, but I love the fact that this is having all of the kids take part in this, and they're creating their own world, really. They're creating their version of, in this case, the Forgotten Realms, and this is a good step in creative writing of reasoning why something is the way it is. I love it. Remember to work as a team and let your imagination soar. There's no right or wrong way to tell a story. This is true. And it's your team story. Have fun. So I love this. It's a great activity. There's a lot of educational value in it. Activity three, the plot thickens. Now that you've designed your stories, characters, and setting, you're going to create the plot. In part one, you're starting with motivation. What do your characters hope to accomplish on the island adventure? And then each character can have their own goal, or the whole team can have a common goal that they're trying to go through. They have some examples of what some goals could be to get the thought process going, like discovering whether a legend is true, searching for treasure, but they could also just create their own and put it in the other column. But understanding the why, the motivation of those characters is essential for driving the plot. In part two, they're making things interesting, adding some challenges or situations below to the storyline. But remember, use the character profile chart. Remember, we put that together at the beginning of making the characters or toward the end of making the characters. And you can make sure that the character can handle the challenges. So this is part of the game where a dungeon master usually will craft an idea for adventure. But you have to have an adventure, you don't have to, but it makes more sense to have an adventure that's fun, that people can potentially succeed at. It's still challenging and maybe they'll fail, but they have an idea of how they can overcome the challenges. So the dice are going to have that element of whether something happens or doesn't, we'll get there in a little bit. Mark the location of the situations that we want on the map. So here are some of the situations. Some of the island inhabitants do not like visitors. They think you are there to steal from their island. So you would put a little marker to say where in your map, where in this island is that going on? Let's skip down a little bit. As you're exploring, a net made of leaves and branches cascades down around you so they get a trap. And maybe you can put that in a forest somewhere and there's some people there that are trying to, you know, catch intruders or something like that. So you have some key things that you're going to place sort of triggers for these events to happen as the characters explore the island. Really great a way to simplify adventure building and make it something that people can dive into. Part three, you use this table of abilities and behaviors to empower your characters for their adventure. Choose an item from each row that your character must do in the story or let fate decide by casting a die to determine your choices. So choose one item from the row that your character must do in the story. So you could say if it's a combat thing, they need to be able to help someone or from a magical perspective, make someone or something invisible or from a physical activity. Maybe they need to swim and maybe that, you know, watery feature of their island inside is the place to do that. So this is something to sort of, you know, embody what the characters are good at and give them a task that they want to complete during the game. All right, fourth activity is gear up. D&D characters often need special equipment to help them achieve their goals, whether it's a disguise kit or a wizard's wand. What equipment will your character need for their adventure? So part one about this is thinking about their skills and the challenges they might face on the island. They've kind of done some reconnaissance or they've heard the stories. So what do they think they're gonna come up against? And then the chart below lists the various items that could be useful. And here's where the math comes in a little bit. You have 30 gold pieces to gear up, but you gotta choose carefully. So you can check off the things that you wanna 
spend money on. So battle gear, things like swords and hand axes and darts and protective gear like leather armor or metal helmets or an invisible barrier, whatever that is. For those of you D&D purists out there, notice that they're making some adjustments, and I think they're good adjustments, to help people learn how to play the game a little bit and to make this fit in with a classroom curricula a little bit. So I think it's okay. It doesn't break D&D for everybody. It just helps them think of things in a different way. Anyway, adventuring gear. You got things like that disguise kit they talked about, candles, locks, rope, thieves tools. Um, then you need to total up how much money you're spending. Part two, re-examine your choices by using the space below to explain how you think each item purchased will help your character. And if you have second thoughts, make some changes. And then it's really some critical thinking. How do I actually make use of these items? Or am I just loading up on a spear and a hammer and a crossbow? and a trident and a dart because all that stuff's cool. It's time to really think about what the character would do. Again, it comes back to role play with a role playing game. Part three, let the storytelling begin. With your team, you gather your character profiles, setting maps and backstories, potential plot points, and equipment lists for easy reference as you start your adventure, a dicey adventure. During a D&D adventure, players roll dice to determine the outcomes of a challenge or encounter. In addition, characters can gain or lose points, called modifiers, depending on whether they have what it takes to succeed in that situation. Let's see how it's done. So, part one, you pick one of five character types listed in the first column, so we already know what those are because we've seen all of those character profiles before. You read the scenario, and in each one, you use a different skill. And so there's a skill at the top of the chart. They're calling them skills, but abilities. So like strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, they're just calling them skills here. And that's, that's okay. So in the first one, your team has just landed on the shores of the mysterious Stormwreck Isle, and they want to get the lay of the land before you begin exploring. Luckily, there's a town nearby and the local inn seems to be a good place to gather information. Unluckily, the innkeeper is suspicious of travelers. You'll need plenty of charisma to convince him to share what he knows. Now, it says roll the die to see what happens. This gives you a breakdown of the information that you get based on the role that you have. And so if they've picked the right person, they've got a better shot, but you can have anybody try to do this. And then they can go through and roll, add their modifier or subtract if they are not good at a certain thing. And then read what happens based on the points that they got. I think it works really well to train someone to understand how the system works. Rolling a 20, adding a modifier or subtracting a penalty, and then what is your store? These to us are called difficulty classes in the D&D world, and right here it's already set for you, which is nice. Same thing in number two. This time they're dealing with some dragons here, so they've got a blue dragon spark renderer and there's a lightning cone that happens. Blue dragons, pretty cool. And then you need to have dexterity to leap out of the way. And if you don't succeed, you need to roll again and do constitution to see if you recover from being hit by all that electricity. Part two, it's the role play time. So you've already kind of just done this in a very mechanical way of talking things through, but then you act out the scenarios with your team. So every team member can take a turn for each scenario. So you get a chance of doing all of these Yes, there's a little repetition here, but it's a way to learn how to play. And so this is a great way of doing it. Here is that game overview we talked about before. Here's the character overview. Everything is in this document that is needed for the teacher. I really think this is a great way to do it, guys. I think this is an essential way that you can introduce not only people in a classroom, but also just D&D in general. You can use this as a way of building characters and understanding what the game is. It breaks it down in a very nice, cohesive way, I think. It's not perfect. There are some things that we could all squibble with, but, you know, I think as far as a teacher's perspective, I like it. Thanks for sticking with me while I went through some of the educator resources that are there. I think they're very useful, like I mentioned before, but you be the judge and let me know in the comments below if you're an educator and you plan on using any of these. And if you do, how did it go? I'm going to leave you with a little geek philosophy that is actually something that got quoted to me when I was a kid by both a grandmother and my teacher when I was in elementary school. And it was just a fun thing that we used to say. Ladies and jelly spoons. 
I come before you to sit behind you and tell you something I know nothing about. This Thursday, which is Good Friday, there's a Mother's Day meeting for fathers only. No admission, pay at the door, take your seat, and sit on the floor. Cheers.